Thank you all for joining us for the webinar today. My name is Scott Holstein. I am the Director of Marketing and Business Development for Computrols. And today we're here to talk about why you should consider a career in the building automation industry. Um, I've been in this industry for just four short years now, but um, I can tell you when I came in, I didn't really have a background in um, in any of it. Um, I was a sales and marketing person um, who kind of came into the role and uh, really got very, very interested in this industry and, um, you know, learning how quickly it was growing. It was very exciting, but to be quite honest, it was a happy accident for me. Uh, but in 2019, the building automation industry made about $75 billion in revenue. And that growth is, uh, is expected to continue. 2024, we're projecting about $121 billion in this industry. Um, so, as you all probably already know, automation has become a huge part of our daily lives, and what we're seeing is it's becoming a much larger part of our daily lives on a regular basis, and um, what we're going to talk about today is going to be more geared towards automation in large commercial building spaces. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our presenter today. It's our CEO of CompuTrolls, Drew Meir. Um, Drew has been with the company since 2008. And as you can see, he's worked through a number of roles. Drew started as a 19-year-old electrical helper, uh, was eventually promoted to a full-on technician, started uh, uh, managing projects on his own, became a project manager, managed our Tampa branch for a year, um, then was brought back as an operations manager, then promoted to VP of operations, and then eventually to the CEO. So. Drew has a, an extremely unique view on this industry because he's seen it from so many different angles. And so I highly encourage you, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's a technician role that you might be interested in, if it's an engineering role that you might be interested in, please don't hesitate to ask specific questions. Uh, Drew's breadth of experience really um, is going to give him the opportunity to answer a lot of those for you, even though um, he's only, you know, a single person within a company. Um, and Drew uh, was recently awarded with uh, the Young Guns Award for Control Trends. Um, that is a industry publication we have uh, in the building automation field. But without further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to Drew and let him get started here. Well, thank you for the introduction, Scott, and thank you again. As Scott mentioned, really appreciate everybody taking time out of their day uh, to join us today. Um, I have a couple goals for today's uh, webinar. Something that I've uh, certainly become uh, passionate about, as, as Scott kind of alluded to, is um, building awareness about the building automation industry. But one of the challenges that we face is uh, obscurity, in my opinion, in this industry. You know, if I go back in time, um, it's an industry that I was never uh, made aware of. And I think that um, we're, we're often exposed to different career paths, such as those that, that, that are commonly and readily known, uh, healthcare, doctors, nurses, um, a law, uh, police officers, and uh, attorneys, and um, education professors, and, and teachers, and counselors uh, are very uh, widespread and commonly known uh, career paths. However, uh, not very much exposure, in my opinion, to uh, the building automation industry as a, a whole. And it's, it's uh, sort of become a passion of mine to um, educate our youth on uh, the industry as a, a whole and the opportunities that exist within. As Scott uh, mentioned, the, the industry is, is booming. Uh, there's a, a lot of growth, and, and what we're seeing is there's not enough uh, talent coming in uh, to the industry, um, and there's going to be a bottleneck at some point as a, a result of that. We're going to continue to grow, and if we don't have people to fill the roles, it is going to create uh, very big challenges. Uh, so my goal for today is to, to build ed awareness as to uh, – what the building automation industry is. I'll give a quick overview on, on Compatrols as a company and our differentiators in the uh, industry. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the career opportunities that exist uh, within the industry. Uh, so let's start with uh, understanding what exactly a, a building automation uh, system is. And I'm gonna take a, a little um, different way of explaining this and hopefully um, it helps to, to understand uh, this. This home automation is becoming so prominent in our day-to-day -day lives. I think it a, a, provides a good segue 
and to those that are, have not been exposed to the building automation industry. Uh, so as many of you likely uh, have seen, uh, home automation has essentially become a part of our day-to-day our -day lives to some extent. Certainly, uh, you can't turn on the television without seeing a uh, commercial about um, either home automation, um, IoT, or the Internet of Things, uh, as they refer to it, and or artificial intelligence machine learning. It, it seems like those are the, the prime focuses of commercials that we're, we're seeing today. And um, home automation plays a, a role in all three of those uh, categories uh, to some extent. Uh, as they use the tech, home automation products to use the artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, technologies to, to some degree. And they are IoT devices, Internet of Things devices. Uh, some of the uh, places where you may have seen uh, home automation are, are smart speakers such as Amazon's Alexa uh, product. Um, I believe Google has an equivalent as well. Um, I refer to those as, as smart or intelligent uh, speakers. Um, you can send commands, say, hey, Alexa, play this song, or Alexa, um, tell me what the weather is like outside, et cetera. Um, smart thermostats. This is one that really aligns well with the building automation industry because it's, it's HVAC related, which is one of the uh, – core uh, systems within a building that uh, encompasses uh, the building automation world. And what a smart thermostat does is it does building automation on a, a smaller scale, uh, to, to be frank. Um, those of you familiar with the, the Nest thermostat, uh, I believe that's one of the most uh, predominant ones on the, the market, but essentially it's a uh, thermostat that gets connected to the internet. and by being connected to the internet, it provides the thermostat to be controlled remotely. Uh, you can monitor the temperature and your temperature and humidity. I believe it has humidity sensor built in as well. Uh, monitor the temperature and humidity inside of your home remotely, and it also provides some control features. So I can change the set point in my uh, home uh, through a mobile application or a web interface. Um, and then, um, in terms of smarts, the uh, thermostat uses uh, some machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms uh, to make some decisions based off of uh, the data that it, it calculates. I believe there's an occupancy sensor um, on the uh, thermostat as well. So it, it, what it attempts to do is, is predict when you're home and when you're away and, and build schedules as to optimize uh, the energy efficiency within your home based off of the data that it collects and the decisions that it makes and in the input that you, you provide. So it may actually look at um, data that you you enter in to the the system by changing the set point. So if you go to the thermostat every evening around between the, let's say the time frame of 6 p.m. and 6:30 and drop the set point from 74 degrees to 72 degrees. The thermostat may uh, start to to learn that uh, routine and do it automatically as a, a result of the data input that you you provided. So. That's a, an example of a, a um, home automation device that has a lot of similar functionalities to uh, that of a, a building automation system, which we'll go into uh, further detail. Another avenue that you may see um, exploding in the, the home automation world are, are smart or intelligent locks, um, locks that allow you to use your phone as a, a key or send a key to uh, let's say your your housekeeper for temporary access, uh, something that's uh, becoming more and more commonplace in the home automation world. Um, so I, again, I, I spoke about home automation in order to create a bridge or a segue into the the building automation world, um, because I, I think once you have some sort of foundation, it, it's a lot easier to to build from than than starting from scratch. Uh, Home automation and building automation, while very different, do have some of that uh, same core architecture or, or same core foundation, if you will. Uh, they use some of the same uh, principles. Building automation has been around for, for quite a long time, and uh, having the, the onset and the growth in the, the home automation, I, I believe, uh, helps to create that segue as we try to educate people on what to expect uh, within the building automation world. Some of the primary differences between the two are the, the fact that um, buildings, unlike your, your home or residences, are much more complicated. And we're going to talk about 
uh, how how these buildings that we live, work, learn, and play in are much more complicated than uh, a residence and, and get into more of the details. Yeah, Drew, and something I think that's worth noting as well is uh, as we talk about the home automation industry, um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, it might surprise you to know that the home automation industry in many ways is ahead of the commercial building automation industry. It's surprising, I think, only because, you know, you think, okay, this is, these are technologies that are scaled in much larger facilities, um, but in reality, it's actually easier to do this on a smaller scale, and, uh, and also, you know, that technology for consumers is moving much more quickly than some of that B2B technology. Scott, that's a good point. Um, I think that that's uh, something that we see as a whole is uh, in home automation, those are what we would refer to as uh, consumer products. And technology as a whole, in my experience, is much faster to evolve and be adopted in the consumer uh, market than, let's say, in, in the building automation industry. For instance, uh, in the building automation industry, New technology is, is slower to be adopted in and, and leveraged, whereas you, you're seeing smart speakers uh, that have been in the home automation industry for a couple of years now. It's only now becoming commonplace to see where that, that voice technology is being integrated into these, these building automation systems. Uh, so we'll get into um, what exactly a building automation system is. So like a home automation system, there, there are two core functionalities or, or purposes for a building automation system. Uh, the first being a uh, centralized uh, means of monitoring and, and controlling different systems or functions within a building. And uh, secondly, uh, efficiency. Um, these systems exist to, to help run our buildings more efficiently, efficiently both from a, a labor, labor standpoint and from an energy efficiency uh, purpose. Uh, one of the core uh, fundamentals of a, a building automation system is to, to create uh, environmentally uh, safe and efficient and healthy working environments for building occupants. Um, the core uh, systems that a building automation system typically encompass are uh, lighting control, access control, fire alarm, and HVAC control. HVAC control where you're you're able to get the HVAC and lighting control where you're able to get the, the most efficiency as they're um, tied to the, the largest load in terms of uh, kilowatts usage or consumption within a uh, commercial building, whether it be uh, healthcare, commercial real estate, hospitals, et cetera. You can find building automation systems in all of those vertical markets. Um, and the building automation system is, is primarily uh, the interconnection of uh, many of those systems. It's something that we'll talk a little bit further when we get into um, building science. But uh, whenever I describe a building automation system, I, I attempt to bring it, break it down into the three independent categories, the first of which is a some sort of user interface. It is a software, um, both CompuTrolls and every other, every one of our competitors within the industry um, has some sort of software user interface. This is the, the software, the tool that is, is used by building operators, uh, technicians to monitor and control the, these different elements within a building. Um, and this software communicates through a, uh, typically a CAT5 backbone, some sort of communication uh, backbone. So that's the second uh, piece of the, the building automation system is some sort of IT infrastructure, a means for interconnecting that, that software uh, user interface um, to uh, the devices that are out in the field, which we refer to as controllers. And what a controller does is it's a, a piece of electronic hardware that uh, monitors and controls end devices. Um, end devices can consist of both inputs and outputs, and input is something that um, we read into the system. So think maybe a temperature sensor or a humidity sensor, or um, another example would be a daylight sensor. Um, and then a Output is a device that we use to control some piece of equipment. So, uh, for instance, if uh, in uh, a daylight uh, scenario, uh, we could have a sensor in place that monitors uh, daylight. So it, it knows when the sun is up and when the sun is down. And we may have an output device, uh, a relay, that is used to turn lights on and off, very similar to a, a light switch, but an automated 
light switch, or a relay that could be used as an output device to control the light. And then we can uh, use the building automation system to do some very cool things, in my opinion. Uh, we can monitor the daylight, and uh, daylight is, is monitored in a, a term called foot candles. Uh, so you can monitor the, the foot candles that ambient uh, window light may be providing. And then uh, when the foot candles get to a point where we bl uh, blow a, a thir certain threshold, we could say, okay, turn on the control point, the, the relay, and as a result, the, the indoor lights would come on. It's an example of inputs and outputs working together, and those, all three of those core components uh, coming together. So you have your, your head-end user interface that's uh, being used to, to monitor and control uh, these different devices that are out in the field, and it's able to, to get and receive and um, do that through that network infrastructure that I described. So three core elements of a building automation system, again, the head-end uh, user interface, the software program, um, that IT backbone, that communication network uh, out to those uh, field devices um, that are interconnected through the control boards that I, I mentioned, those uh, electronic pieces of hardware. So I, I touched base on, in the previous slide a little bit about um, building science. And this is where, uh, as I alluded to in uh, the previous slide, where it really gets fun um, because, um, and I, I think that one of the unknowns as uh, of the industry, all of the different and complicated systems and, and the knowledge of what it actually takes to run these large complex buildings and uh, how they're interconnected. You know, I can go back to Scott uh, mentioned uh, my my growth or my my road, uh, my path, my career path in this industry. And I started as a, a technician. I can go back to uh, my early days um, entering these buildings for the, the the very first time and and not knowing, being so naive as to uh, what it took to run a, a building on a day to day aspect, not having any knowledge of. Uh, the different mechanical systems, the fire alarm systems, the lighting systems, all of these these things, elevators that that uh, uh, exist within buildings and how they all interconnect and the inner workings. And that, for me, is one of the exciting things about the, the field is getting exposed to the inner workings of these buildings and then how these systems interconnect um, to create unique sequence of operations uh, and then learning uh, at, thereafter that every single building that I've ever entered um, in my, my time in the career operates 100% different. Every building has a different sequence of operations. They're each unique in their, their own aspects. Um, having been in the, the field for quite some time, uh, for quite some time, we go to we're exposed to facilities that might be a campus where they have two identical buildings on the campus, and from the exterior they look exactly alike. However, they operate completely differently. So there's every single building out there operates, it has its own unique sequence of operations and operates independent of one another. And these, these complicated systems within these buildings oftentimes interact with uh, one another in ways that we never get exposed to. Uh, the, the building uh, runs and there are handshakes in between different systems that exist that um, the building occupants are never exposed to, but the people, the, the technicians, the building operators, uh, field technicians, et cetera, they get exposed to this by knowledge within the, the industry. And I'll provide a, a handful of examples of these handshakes uh, that exist. So uh, we'll begin with, let's say, a uh, fire alarm example. Uh, so a, a smoke detector, if you will, in a building is an input device. Its purpose in life is to monitor for smoke. If it senses smoke, then it sends a signal to the, the fire alarm control board, that electronic field hardware that I, I mentioned earlier. And as a result, a sequence of operations is um, initiated. Uh, now, one of those uh, operations may be to uh, initiate um, speakers and strobes, um, notification devices to make building occupants aware that there's a, a fire going on in the building. Uh, another operation that may uh, get triggered as a result of that uh, fire alarm coming in, uh, the, that smoke detector detecting smoke, is the release of access control locks. Now, these are two independent systems. However, they work together to achieve a sequence of operations. In this instance, we're going to unlock all of the access control doors that were previously locked 
so that people have free egress out of the, the building and can evacuate safely. Another event that may take place as a result of that um, smoke detector detecting smoke is the recalling of elevators. When there is a fire condition or uh, smoke condition in a building, it's uh, the preference that you do not use elevators. And as a result, the elevators will um, close their doors and recall to their, their floor of egress and remain there um, so that elevators cannot be used. And the voice evacuation system within the building will notify uh, building occupants to use the stairwell as an evacuation rather than the elevators. These are all, again, independent systems that, that work in unison and uh, in order to achieve different tasks during this a single event. Another uh, use in this, the same uh, application is the fact that the HVAC system is oftentimes um, involved in terms of a uh, smoky vac uh, situation. And again, this is all independent of every every building has its own sequence and uh, own operation that it, it is to uh, follow during uh, different events. And this is just one example. This is I'm only talking right now about a single smoke detector going into a long. A, a single building may have thousands of uh, smoke detectors, and they could essentially. Uh, it, it's oftentimes not done this way, but essentially they could all generate a unique sequence of operations. Um, getting back to the HVAC uh, handshake that I, I was speaking of, as a result of that smoke detector being triggered, that uh, may trigger a, a smoke evacuation sequence on the HVAC system. And when that happens, the uh, HVAC system may uh, shift gears from a, a cooling uh, standpoint, occupant comfort standpoint, to a means of evacuating the smoke from the building so that smoke doesn't build up and uh, infect the, the building occupants. So a lot of different uh, sequences, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, uh, one more example that I'd like to share is a, a scenario that I actually had the opportunity to, to work on the, the programming and implementation of when I was uh, working in uh, Central Florida, Tampa specifically. And the uh, chief engineer at that uh, property uh, had made some comments. He had a lot of brilliant ideas about how to run his building more efficiently. And one of the um, energy efficiency strategies that we use in the building automation industry is a uh, feature called um, optimal start stop. And what optimal start stop is, is um, you say that you have a space within a building that is going to be occupied by at, at 8 a.m. every morning, Monday through Friday. And what optimal start, uh, an optimal start stop uh, program does is you enter what the desired set point of that space is at a given time on each day. And what the system does is it runs uh, computer algorithms to determine what the very last second is that we can start the cooling equipment uh, in order to achieve that set point when the space will be occupied. And as a result of that, there are energy savings. So uh, going back to my example in, in Central Florida, this chief engineer said, you know, I'm, I'm getting the very most out of my building automation system because I'm using the optimal start, but I think that I can get even more. He had a, a rather uh, good idea, and uh, I, I must preface this with Florida provides some, some optimal weather conditions, uh, which, which makes this uh, sequence possible. Um, and this probably wouldn't work in hotter and, and climates such as New Orleans, where I'm, I'm located and where we have uh, big humidity problems. Um, and this, uh, this gentleman also had data on his parking and his building occupancy uh, within the, the property as well. So he knew that 90% of the build, uh, it was somewhere between 90 and 95% of his building occupants uh, got to work every day through uh, driving and utilizing the parking garage. They didn't have a, a bunch of people taking the, the city bus or uh, subway or anything like that. 90 to 95% of the, the building occupants use the parking garage on a daily basis. Uh, so, and then through his access control system, he knew when people were showing up. So what he decided to do uh, in lieu of using um, optimal start stop, I must add that the building uh, parking garage is set up in such a way 
that there is a sky bridge between the, the primary building and the parking garage. So uh, what the vision of this engineer was, hey, when the first person from any given floor scans their access badge in the morning, I'm going to wait until that point to start the uh, air handling units, the air conditioning units, uh, to um, to trigger versus doing optimal start stop because at that point, uh, that's when the first tenant's going to uh, arrive, and I probably have enough time to cool that space. So I, when they scan for the first time, uh, I start the air handling unit. The uh, Building occupant then needs to travel up the parking garage, park their car, take the garage elevator um, over to the to whatever floor the sky bridge is, walk across the sky bridge, and then take the building elevator up to their dedicated floor. So that buys a window of somewhere between five to fifteen minutes, arguably. Uh, and the engineer thought, I think that's probably enough time to get some air moving and get the space to where. Uh, it's comfortable enough for a building occupant. And it ended up uh, working uh, in his favor, and they, they saved some money as a, a result. So that's another uh, way that you can have handshakes between different systems. In this case, it was access control and HVAC control. Um, so real quick, uh, do an overview of uh, comp controls. Um, comp controls is, uh, as I, I think I just mentioned, a headquarter just outside of uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Gretna. This is where we design, manufacture uh, all of our, our products. So we have a 100% design manufactured uh, product here in the United States. We do all of our own software development for our, our user interface, whether it be mobile applications, web-based products, or some appliance that sits on a, a desk in a building. We also design and manufacture our own line of HVAC control boards, lighting control board, access control boards, and fire alarm uh, boards. That's designed and manufactured here. Uh, proud to say that it's a, a made in the USA prod, uh, product, and we back all of our uh, products that we manufacture with the industry's only lifetime warranty. And our core competency actually is integration to um, both non proprietary and proprietary uh, communication protocols. So, actually, uh, protocols being uh, the communication mechanism that's used between a uh, user interface software and uh, that field hardware. So, we actually um, reverse engineer those uh, proprietary protocols and embed them in, in our uh, solution. Uh, so I want to get into some potential career paths that exist in the building automation industry. Uh, first and foremost is uh, low voltage electrician. These are installation uh, technicians that would primarily be responsible for um, installing uh, any electrical conduit or, or fittings that are associated or the raceways that are associated with um, um, carrying the wire or housing the wiring that interconnect the uh, field devices that I mentioned or uh, providing that uh, raceway and wiring for uh, the IT backbone that I uh, previously mentioned uh, within the, the building automation industry. Um, and then field technicians, um, they wear a, a plethora of hats. Um, I always say that a, a field technician, uh, a good field technician, um, has uh, three core skills, and uh, skill number one is that uh, he's got an excellent uh, mechanical background. He understands mechanical systems exceptionally well. Uh, number two, he understands electrical systems exceptionally well, and then uh, has a, a good uh, is well rounded with IT also, um, because a good field technician needs to encompass all three on on any given day. So almost a jack of all trades. Um, daily uh, task of a, a field technician may include uh, running service calls where you use tools such as a uh, electrical meter to look at voltage or amperage and, and see how things are operating, um, programming sequence of operations for a, a building, installing control boards, um, end devices, et cetera. Um, and I, I mentioned Comptrol is a, a, manuf is a manufacturer of electronics, uh, so we have manufacturing technicians as well. And the uh, bottom left quadrant of the, the picture collage that Scott has up, you'll see our, our manufacturing line. So a manufacturing tech would be uh, responsible for running a, a production line, a surface mount a production line, and or uh, soldering uh, through-hole components on electronics, uh, doing different uh, soldering uh, mechanisms or, or testing boards as part of our testing procedure before 
uh, board ship out the, the door. Uh, very similar is a, a bench technician. A uh, bench technician uh, is well-rounded in uh, electronics and, and circuit board design um, for, for testing purposes uh, and repair purposes. Um, so as a, a part of our lifetime warranty, we do repairs on, on circuit boards as, as well. Um, on the development side, well, we have uh, software engineers who develop those user interfaces that we've been talking about. They write that back-end code in different uh, languages um, for the software applications or the, the user interfaces that, that we provide to our customers, whether it be uh, a mobile application or a web page. Um, and then hardware engineers, these are the, the guys and gals that are responsible for designing the actual circuit boards uh, that we manufacture. So they lay out all the components, um, they take an idea and they, they make something happen from that idea. Starts on the, with a computer design and then it finishes with an actual product that you can hold in your hand. Uh, similar to, to software developers, uh, we have firmware engineers as well that uh, they're responsible for uh, making those electronic hardware devices that we manufacture have some sort of identity. So at the uh, very beginning, uh, when you, you get that, that piece of hardware that the hardware engineer designed, um, it has no identity. It, it requires firmware or, or an embedded software, if you will, to, to know what its identity is and, and how it's going to function. So that's actually the, the piece that of the, the puzzle for the, the hardware that, that makes it all uh, come to work. Um, and then there, there are common uh, uh, career paths that are, are commonly known within uh, the world that, that are also available in our um, industry as well, one being graphic artists. So as a part of our user interface packages and, and our competitors user interface packages, uh, oftentimes graphic, the graphical user interface is a part of that. So graphic artists are are required and and sales and marketing. So you can you do sales and marketing in the the beverage industry, the hospitality industry, and you can also do it in in the building automation industry. Um, here we have uh, some of those different um, positions and the uh, I guess the average um, salaries based off of Glassdoor and, and pay scale. I give you an idea of. Uh, what the, the pay looks like uh, for these different positions that exist within the industry. Uh, and then next, lastly, I'm going to play a short video that uh, hopefully will do a, a, a good job of detailing, uh, bringing this all to, together. Um, and it's a, a building that um, has a lot of automated and, and unique features within it that, that kind of showcases some building automation aspects. Welcome to The Edge. This is certifiably the greenest office building in the world. But that just might be the least interesting part about it because The Edge in Amsterdam is also possibly the most connected office space in the world. Working at The Edge is insane. It all starts with a smartphone app developed by the building's main tenant, the consulting firm Deloitte. When you arrive at the edge, a camera recognizes you by your license plate for automatic access. And because it's the Netherlands, there are charters available for electric cars. Inside, things start to get interesting because you don't have a desk. No one here does. Workspaces are assigned to you based on your schedule for the day. You have options a work booth, a meeting room, what they call a concentration room, a sitting desk, a standing desk, a balcony desk. You can even just hang out in the sun-filled atrium all day. This concept is called hot desking, and it's what allows Deloitte to have 2,500 workers, but less than half as many desks at its Dutch headquarters. The app knows your preferences, and when you arrive at your workspace, the lights dim or brighten based on your stored settings and any of the building's massive flat screens can be instantly paired with an iPhone or a laptop. So what makes all this possible? The LED light panels developed by Philips specifically for the edge are actually powered by low voltage ethernet cables, which means every light in the building becomes its own internet connected data hub with 28,000 sensors that makes the building and its users smarter. 
the building becomes a very important part of who we are and what we want to be and we actually seen in recruitment that more people are now spontaneously coming to Deloitte because they want to work in this building. Oh yeah, and then there's these. The building has solar on the roof and on the south facing wall, enough to power the building and all of the electric cars, computers and smartphones used by its employees. And those employees are kept warm by two enormous boreholes tunneling more than 400 feet down beneath the building. During the summer, the edge pumps warm water deep into the aquifer, where it sits insulated until it can be sucked back out in the winter to warm the building. Outside, there are beehive towers and bat homes to support the local pollinators. And even the rainwater is collected to flush the toilets and irrigate the gardens. We uh, are planning to build a lot more buildings like these. And the next one will be smarter, and the one after that will be smarter as well. And we won't stop until all cities in the world are filled with buildings that are intelligent and that are not using any energy anymore. In the end, we will actually need less buildings in the world, but the buildings that are there will be used in a better way, will be more efficient, and will be, uh, will be using a lot less energy than in the past. Sometimes the edge just feels like it's showing off, and some of the app functionality isn't quite ready for prime time yet. But most of the time, this is all running seamlessly in the background. It's maybe the most fully realized vision of the Internet of Things the world has ever seen. It's a building that has sustainability as an important aspect of making a good place to work. In Dutch, there is even a word for this new kind of thinking about the workspace, the new America. In a nutshell, it means that um, work space is more focused on the tasks that need to be done and the working community that it's part of. Another day at the edge comes to an end. A custom security robot that looks a bit like R2-D2 wakes up and begins its patrols. Now, if only the app could automatically come conjure up a nice dinner recipe, maybe provide all the fresh ingredients at the end of the day to get you cooking. No surprise. The Edge has that too. Bon appetit. That video, uh, in my opinion, does a good job of, of summing up some of the uh, different systems that ex exist within a, a building and, and how they, they work together uh, to create um, a healthy and, and functional working environment for the, the building occupants. Just want to thank everybody who attended today. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, there will be a recording um, that we'll send out to you in the next few days here. And uh, if there's anything that we can do for you in terms of, you know, answering questions regarding our industry and career paths, um, you can email us at careers at um, Obviously, in uh, today's market uh, with, with COVID-19 um, pandemic going on, uh, the, the job availability may not be what it normally is and, and won't be what it normally is when, uh, when things recover. Um, however, you know, the majority of the time you're going to look at uh, different building automation uh, companies, uh, you're, you're going to find that there's quite a bit of a need for uh, filling these types of positions that Drew uh, mentioned. All right, with that said, thank you all again for attending and have a great day.